Oh, so this is the second part of the of the retreat. I really hope that you had a really beautiful time of prayer and a way to really uh, deepen on this this theme that we're praying with about having miracles in our lives and believing in miracles. And uh, for me personally, after praying with that that talk that Father Dan gave, like I really had this desire to be more and more convinced that miracles can happen and that they happen for a reason. And like there's our life is full of miracles. And as we've heard about it, like all of the history of the church over the centuries, all of the lives of the saints, everything, it's it's built upon this as well, too, that miracles do happen. And so now I think the question I'd like to deepen on a bit more in the second part is maybe make it a bit more personal. Do you believe that miracles can, do, and will happen in your life personally? And because this is a very different thing to say to ourselves. I know, for example, that God worked in amazing ways in the gospel. I know that in the Acts of the Apostles, they were doing miracles. But is that saying like, okay, when Jesus was here in the flesh and blood, he was able to do it, obviously. And the Holy Spirit was there in Pentecost, the first disciples. So they were able to work with, with the miracles. And of course, the saints during the thing, they're, they're saints. <laughs> they're really special people. They're able to, to do these things. What about ourselves? I think this is an interesting question because it really starts to talk a little bit about, do you believe that the Holy Spirit that was working in the Acts of the Apostles is the same Holy Spirit that you were baptized in, that you were confirmed in? Or is there different Holy Spirit? And this is, this is something that we have to really have a look at. There's really only, there's only one Holy Spirit. There's only one faith. There's only one. And this is what St. Paul talks about in Ephesians. So those of you who've got your Bible, you can have a look at it. Ephesians chapter 4. All of the chapter of four of Ephesians is really pretty amazing. I'm just going to focus on the first seven verses because it talks a lot about this point of like um, that we only have one faith. The faith that we've received is the same as the faith that everyone else has received all the way through. So it says, I therefore, and this is St. Paul speaking, I therefore, a prisoner in the Lord, beg you to leave a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And that calling is to be a Christian. That's not just talking about people who are called to be uh, priests or anything like that. Everyone. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And then I like this part. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. For each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gifts. So this is, this is for me, this is really deep and it's really powerful because it's telling us, don't separate yourself from the faith that was given to us by Jesus himself. Don't try and separate yourself from the power of the Holy Spirit working that was working in the first church, that has worked through all the saints, that wants to work in your life as well. It's as real today as it was back then, and it's as real today as it is that was working in St. Mother Teresa or St. John Paul II or someone that you see in the world close to you. It's working in you as well too. And th I found this pretty fascinating to pray a little bit about that hopefully that's what we'll do this second session pray with the times that you've seen god working and what have been your experiences of having miracles in your own life in different ways and for me i was thinking about some of the miracles that i've witnessed i have witnessed miracles maybe not so amazing as some of the ones we hear about with other people but i've witnessed miracles and for, for example, the first time I've been a priest only for a very short time, Dan and I only got a day a few months ago, a bit more. The first time I gave the anointing of the sick, it was an amazing experience. I went to a, a uh, retirement home and the, the lady there had been unresponsive for a while. I didn't realize exactly, but when I uh, administered the sacrament, 
when I did the sign of the cross and prayed over her and then gave her the oil and anointed her with oil in that moment, she woke up and she did a sign of a cross in that moment as well too. She responded to what was happening. And it was only in that moment that the, the son who had been sitting there beside her told me afterwards, he said, like with full amazement in, her, in his eyes and everything saying, you, you realize that she's been unresponsive for two days. For two full days, she'd been lying there basically sort of like in a coma. Yet with that action, she responded and she, she woke up and responded, not just any type of response either with, with the sign of the cross as well too. And it really did make, made a big mark on me <laughs> because uh, it makes you wonder how many times is God working in our lives? What's he doing? And, and do we have that power to, to do our own miracles as well too with our lives? Especially it got me thinking about the miracles of the sacrament. I thought we could pray a little bit about them as well too in the time of prayer when you got a chance because the sacraments are amazing. And are you, are you really convinced that the sacraments are moments of God doing miraculous things in your life with his grace? For example, I was talking about the anointing of the sick. It is amazing when you see what God can do in, in different ways. Okay, I do know and I have seen or have heard about how God actually has healed people through the, this sacrament. But also not just that, the fact that you, you maybe haven't been physically healed, but people know that they're, they've been uh, healed in the sense that they know that God's with them, that this moment they're not alone, that their suffering has meaning, has purpose. This isn't something that's against God's plan. These, this is a miraculous understanding as well, too, that people get through that moment as well, too. It's a fascinating miracle. I was thinking of the other sacraments as well, too. The miracle of baptism. It's amazing when you think about what baptism does, that all of our sins have been forgiven, that we, we get confirmed or uh, understood in our, in our understanding that we're a child of God, that we're made in his image and likeness, that we've been given the capacity to act as Jesus acted as well. That's what happens when you get uh, uh, given the, the, the charism, the special oil in the moment of baptism as well too. You get made into a priest and a prophet and a king or a queen. You've been given a chance to act the same way that God wants you to act in his life. We now belong to the body of Christ. This, this is super amazing. And I remember my first baptism that I, I did as a, I actually did it as a deacon. And it was, an, again, it was a, a moment of pure grace in one sense that the, the little girl, her name was Isabella, she was um, <laughs> wiggling around, squirming a lot during the whole, most of the ceremony and most of the rite. But when it came to the actual moment of pouring the water over her head and baptizing her in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, she stopped and looked straight up in my eyes in that moment. I, I still remember those, those eyes looking up at me, especially because they were so big and innocent. They were like a pure, you know, you've probably seen the same too when you look at, at a baby in, in their eyes. But it's something where I understood that, wow, this girl, this uh, little child has been welcomed into the family of God. She's been given all of this grace in this moment. And she's been, uh, like you saying, given her identity as a child of God that no one will ever be able to take away. And that every single person who's been baptized has been given that same grace as well too. So when you look at the people beside you and you can look at all these different Zoom windows in front of me, each one of these have been given that same special grace as well too. And that changes the way you look at people. It, it changes the way you relate to them as well too when you recognize what happens in all these things. Well, the miracle of confession. <laughs> have you, can you really think about what it's like to get your sins taken away? It's incredible. And especially where you've been reborn, where you've been given a check, a second chance, reborn in a sense that you yourself can, you can change the things that you're doing, you're in a, given the grace to go forward, living your life in a different way. Especially now as a priest, I've experienced what it's like on both sides of the confessional. Myself personally had moments where I felt forgiven so much that it's brought me to tears or brought me to big moments of joy where I, I felt like dancing afterwards, where God's given you, this freedom that comes from it. Then also seeing how God's worked through me as well too, to be his instrument, to take people's sins away where they've expressed it themselves on the other side. I won't talk about what they've talked about in confession, of course, but 
I can talk about that result that comes out of it, that, that God has healed someone, made them some, something new, given them a second chance. And I was thinking the miracle of marriage. <laughs> Actually, it's one of the biggest miracles when you think about it. How can two people, two individual, different, autonomous people, often very strong-willed, very, very different from each other, and live together in the same house so closely, so well, can dedicate their whole lives to the other one, to their children, be very selfless, be sacrificial. That's a miracle. And I, I understand it and I see it very much all the way through so many people's lives. I don't like, that's why when people say uh, marriage isn't really a sacrament, of course it is. How could you live that without God's grace? How could you do all of that just by yourselves with no help from above? Because it is something fascinating when you really see people giving their whole lives towards towards that sacrament in, in a really beautiful way. And obviously the miracle of ordination, myself and Father Dan went through it just a couple of weeks, months ago. <laughs> it really is something pretty special to be able to, to, to be given a capacity to act in the person of Christ, which is what actually happens in that moment. And especially talking to many of my friends so many times, they can't believe that they, us two, especially Dan and myself, have changed from one, like who we were, to who we are now. Bring this, I assume, yeah? Is that possible that these long-haired, crazy people can become <laughs> priests for God in everything that we do? And, and I think it's not something that happens normally. That happens only about through the grace of God. And I've been very, very aware of that, especially now at the moment. Every single time in the consecration, for example, in the mass, when I, I, I find it very hard to put it into words, but when I'm holding Jesus in my own hands, when I recognize that God gave me this chance to transform bread and wine into his own body and blood in front of all the other people who were there as well too, how can I not believe in miracles? Especially I'm there holding it there in my own hands. And I know that each one of you have probably had that experience as well because you yourselves have received that same thing in the, in the sacrament of communion as well too. It's a fascinating miracle of communion. I've prayed a lot about that and I think it would be really nice to pray with that this afternoon. A bit. This is one of the greatest of God's miracles, the center of our faith, that God himself comes to down to be with us in this close and personal way that he actually wants us to receive him to eat him <laughs> we go into our bodies father dan has talked about this another time not today but another time. he said <laughs> have a think about what it means that he comes through into our stomachs and then through our digestive system and dan used to study biology so he used to talk about this through your digestive system he goes into every single cell of your body it gets carried out through so that every single part of your body receives that, that thing that you ate. And of course, that's the presence of Jesus. So every single cell that you have has got Jesus brought into it in a new way through the, the miracle of, 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 of communion. And this is why he, he wants us to recognize those things in our lives. And I thought that's why it might be nice to pray with a certain passage that we have from John chapter 14. I'll just read it out very quickly. So if you go John chapter 14, you can read many other parts of it, but I'll just highlight verse number 23. It says, Jesus answered him. And he's talking to his disciples this moment. Those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. It's crazy. But God says that if we love him, if we believe in him, he will come into our lives and live in us. He'll make us his own temple. He'll be, will be his home where he lives and in and amongst us. And I, I think this is something that we probably need to grasp a lot more and to start to really pray with, because we experience that in a tangible way with the communion that we experience in the mass. I know that a lot of us in lockdown in this moment, it's been one of the hardest things is that we, we don't get a chance to do that as a community in a tangible way. 
but it's still the same reality that's what's happened when we love Jesus, when we love him with everything we've got, he comes and lives with us, in us, through us. And that's why we, we should live in a different way when we've had that miracle happen with us. And that's why it's got to change our lives as well too. And this is, this is also why I think it's really nice to pray about miracles because our faith, as Dan had said this morning, or I mean this uh, earlier in this retreat, our faith is built upon miracles because miracles talk about God working in our life. And in the, in the mass or in the, yeah, in the mass that we normally go to, we know that we normally repeat the, the Apostles' Creed. It's what we believe in. So when we're saying this theme of I believe in miracles, in the Apostles' Creed, have you realized that the last part of it is basically saying, I believe in all the miracles of God. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So these are all the things that we believe in. We profess it every single time we, 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 we think about our faith. We believe that he is bringing us all together in one communion. We believe all these forgiveness of sins. So we have to let that declaration mean something to us as well too. Our life should reflect this belief that we have in, in miracles, in God's capacity to work in each one of us, to change us, to transform us, to convert us. And this conversion, I believe, is again one of the greatest miracles of Christ. People who've had their lives changed through belief in him. And I think, obviously, we can see that very clearly in the, in the Bible. If you go to, for example, we don't need to go through and read it all out now, but Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, is the time of the, uh, the uh, conversion of St. Paul. And you can see this, this is an amazing conversion. Someone who was completely against the church, completely against all of Christ's followers, very zealous to actually put them all in prison and worse, to get rid of them, he, in one moment, had this complete encounter with Christ, changed his whole life completely so that he became a follower of Christ who became the most responsible of bringing the gospel all the way through the, the Greco-Roman world of that time. Took it to everywhere. Was one of the greatest missionaries. And the fact that we've got the faith today is very much built upon that conversion that he had. And that, that conversion, that miracle, is the same miracle that happens in each one of our hearts. And you can see it through all the saints going through the world, through the church. Today is um, the feast day of St. Augustine. Pretty amazing saint. If you get a chance to read his story, I, I think most of us are a little bit familiar. This is someone who was, I would say, uh, how would you say, very hedonistic, loved pleasure, loved, uh, loved being a bit of a politician, enjoyed the rhetoric, lived his life very much against the Christian ideals, for a long, long time, so much that it made his mother cry so much. St. Monica was crying for him over and over again. But eventually, when God came into his life, when he understood who Christ was, when he accepted him and believed in him, had a huge transformation so that he became completely unworldly, the opposite. He became very modest, very humble, became a bishop, worked for 34 years in his service for God, wrote so much in terms of uh, all of his letters and then a lot of his ideas put them down on paper so that even now the church probably hasn't been influenced by anyone's work so much in philosophy and theology than St. Augustine for, for centuries, 1,600 years since you think. Each, this transformation is an amazing miracle. And I believe myself, I've, I've experienced it so much. I know Father Dan as well. I know all of you as well too in some ways have experienced this transformation, this conversion as a miracle of God. Honestly, I was never someone who could speak about my faith. When, especially when I was, before really getting understanding who God was, I couldn't speak in front of other people. Yet now I find myself doing it all the time. And I can only put it down to God wants me to do it. And that he's gave me that capacity to do it this time. I know the same with Father Dan. You know that Father Dan was one of the shyest people I ever met before that it changes with time when God gives you that capacity to live in a different way. And as a missionary going all the way around the world many times, over and over again, I've seen that as one of the greatest miracles. People's lives turned around. 
maybe you can't change all the different uh, levels of poverty, all the different problems in the world, but you can change individual lives. And they do change when they come into contact with Christ. It's one of the greatest miracles you'll see over and over again. And fascinating for me to hear stories of it as well, too, of where people can explain what happened after they've experienced God. And I think this only really comes about when we really spend time in prayer. Each time of prayer can be a truly miraculous experience because often we don't see a physical transformation happening in there, but something changes. There's a before and after. And it's the, normally it's the effect that we understand of what God said to us in that, that verse of, on 14. He comes into our heart in a new way and lives in a new way. When we talk to him, when we speak to him, when he let him speak to us, that's what transforms us. And then it gives us this understanding that we've got the Trinity within us and there's no greater power source to ever have than have God himself living within us, giving us that joy, that motivation. And he gives us that, that chance to change in a different way, to experience a little miracle every single moment of your life. So for me, prayer is that transformative moment when you can move from anxiety to peace. You can move from procrastination to the motivation. You can move from being lost to having a direction for having meaning in your life. And we can, you can't fake it either. It's something that only can be done, as Father Dan said earlier, when we really say to God, I believe. And you let your faith lead you into a relationship with him. So I realize that for many of these miracles, I think probably sometimes we don't recognize them as miracles, but they are. And I, what I was thinking we could pray about us today is that recognize that we can experience miracles in our lives that aren't necessarily sensational stories of, of healing or, I don't know, the sun dancing and different things, which can happen. These things do happen as well too. But also that what is happening in our own hearts and many times in the ways that we live is something special. I don't know if you've ever had the chance to look at it. A, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a video about the mass that says what's going on in the mass when you're when you're there and it starts with a normal mass but then there's a moment when the people's eyes who were there in front of the mass start to open up and they start to see what's going on in in the background when we sing the gloria all the angels are there singing there with them the communion the saints are there with them in the communion when you when the priest lifts up the the blessed sacrament it's really jesus like all these things can be only seen with the eyes of faith and that's like the miracle that happens only through when you start to see your eyes or lets you see in a different way with faith behind them. And this changes your whole life. And I'll just share one thing to sort of end with. Uh, a lady rang me this morning who wanted to share with me the miracles that have been happening in her life. So I was talking to her last week and she had different things, but she rang up this morning saying, okay, on Monday or Tuesday, she, would, she was praying last Sunday about, she just lost her job. And then on Monday, she was ringing, she got given the, the good news that God had found her a new job. So well, obviously not God, but, but God through, through the people in the process. But for her, the way that she was expressing it was that this was God's work. God here was working in her life in a different way. And then she talked about her husband went through a COVID scare. So he had to be in isolation for two days, couldn't go home from where he was working. And she was praying so hard, but then when she also understood that God there was with her through the whole moment and that she was living that moment with God, and it was a sign when, especially when she gratefully heard the good news that he didn't have COVID, that God was there listening the whole time. And then like she was sharing about her daughter, her daughter was able to look at a candle. And when you looked at that candle, it had uh, the, the wick was in the, the shape of a cross. <laughs> and like her little, her little daughter said, wow, I saw Jesus' cross in the flames. And then she, she was going, wow, when she sees that, it's actually real. There is something there. You can say it's coincidence and all that kind of things, but the eyes of faith see something there. And then the same way, the way that she expre expressed her whole week was living close to God. So you start to see God's work all the way through it. And she was, I, was, I was asking her, oh, I was saying that this is an amazing way to live. And she said, this has come about a little bit because at the end of each day, she's got into this process of writing down a letter to God. 
writing down all the things that she's recognized God working, seeing God working, writing down and understanding how he's working in a new way at different times. So he's been writing and it's been making her more grateful and then it's opening her eyes every day to have God working in different ways and seeing all these miracles that are happening all the time that maybe she hadn't seen before. So I'm thinking that we'll go now into a time of prayer. I think I've talked long enough. And when we pray, let's pray with this, this desire to try and um, let God unveil all the work that he's doing in our lives. So I'll put a couple of questions into the chat down below. And they're about the different parts that we were, I was mentioning. So the first part is like related to this, uh, 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 sorry, the, the first reading from Ephesians. Pray with God's power about being this, like, um, do you think that you've got the same power as the early church? The Holy Spirit being the same as before and after. Trying to understand whether this is really something that's true in your life. The second part is more praying like with, the, with the power of the sacraments, if you would like to, as miracles. Ponder on a little bit of what God does in the different sacraments, the different ways that he works in your life, and spend a bit of time getting, getting a time where he talks to you through that. The third part may be praying about the, yeah, this miracle of conversion. We've got this passage here of John 14, 23. When God comes into our lives, when he changes us, when he gives us a different direction, pray about the amazing way that God can transform your life. And then the fourth part, this helps as well too, to see how different it is to start living with the eyes of faith. That when we start to see God's work in every single moment of our life. And what can you do in a way to make this more of a reality in your life? Try and think of positive ways or practical ways when you can start to see more of the miracles that happen. If this theme is that we want to say, do you believe in miracles? To try and make it practical that this becomes part of our life. So we'll pray for about 20 minutes again. And if you would like, we can come back about quarter past four and then we'll, we'll do our next part.